Dear friends, I greet you in the most precious name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a joy to serve Jesus Christ. Let me say, friends, there is no name under heaven above the earth whereby men can be saved apart from the name of Christ. Nobody else has proclaimed, nobody has made this claim that I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Christ is life, Christ is the way, and Christ is the truth. You know, today many people are committing suicide. Is, you think it's because of money? No, 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 no. Even the rich children, children of the rich families are committing suicide. How about rich doctors are committing suicide? Affluent people are committing suicide. Movie stars are committing suicide. What's the lesson? So money is not the reason they're committing suicide. They're lacking relationship in life. Let me say something to you. When you come to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you will never have a thought to commit suicide. But if you don't know him, you have a worthless, meaningless life. Therefore, Satan comes with this idea, commit suicide. But when Jesus is the Lord, that desire is gone. So if you're fighting depression, come to Christ. Fighting thought of suicide, come to Christ. Build a relationship with him. He will take care of that. Today, is there a connection between sin and suffering? According to the book of Job, Job's wife says to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. <laughs> oh, my. This is his wife telling him. Curse God and die. So what are we talking about? Is there a connection between sin and suffering? You know, many people have asked me over the years, why does a loving God send people to hell? Why does a loving God send people to hell? Well, the question is not correct. The correct question is, why do people choose hell over a loving God? So with that said, when Job's wife said, curse God, are you still depending on your integrity? Are you going to still stick to that? This is the reply, Job said. You're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Oh, that's the gist of the whole message. Should we expect only good from God and not expect him to give us trouble? He's the God of trouble. He's the God of good. By the way, you go to any church uh, all over the world, there's a new slogan. I don't know whoever came up with it. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Why don't we improve on that, please? God is God, and all the time, God is God. He's God in the time of trouble. He's God in the time when it, things are going well. You know, Job chapter Two, verses 9 through 10 is the text. In all what his wife said, his friends said, the Bible says, Job did not sin in what he said. When calamity struck the house of Job, his friends came at great trouble and inconvenience to comfort and counsel him. Job's friend held to the traditional thought of their day, which in many Respects are still the thought of our day. Even in 2023, people still think like the friends of Job. They believed that God always rewards righteousness. They believe that God always punishes wickedness. That's what they believe. They perceive that righteousness always pays off with peace, prosperity, popularity, plenty, and pre prominence. That's what they believe. Jesus, Job's friends saw God as a judge. They understood him somewhat in terms of his being in prosecuting attorney or as a policeman. They believed that God to be an executioner. They believed God's law was self-operating and self-executing. And if you found yourself in great pain and suffering, it was the proof that you were a great sinner. 
according to the theory of the people of Job's friend and the people that we live with today. The writer of the book of Job challenges all of our simple solution to the complex answers, questions that plague us when we are faced with pain and trouble. The easy answer is usually the incorrect answer. Anybody who is giving you an easy answer, let me tell you this, is almost every time incorrect. Majority always, almost always is wrong. But you know what we do? We go with the majority. Friends, if you believe it in Christ, your majority is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you have three and you, four together, that's majority. You don't need anybody else. You need to make sure that God's on your side. While recognizing that sin ultimately results in suffering, when you study the book of Job, you cannot help but conclude that not all suffering is direct result to sin. Job is an excellent illustration of this great truth. My dear friends, Job was a very good man who did not deserve to suffer as he was suffering. Let's look at some of his suffering. He suffered the loss of all his wealth, wealthy property. He suffered the tragic death of all his children. He suffered the absence of an empathetic wife. We should recognize that when she came to Job and advised him to commit suicide, she was suffering from deep depression from the losses of their family and sustained, that the family had sustained. He suffered the misunderstanding of his sincere friends. Job was a good man, but he had all these sufferings. He suffered indescribable pain. Is there a connection between sin and suffering? The answer could be yes, and the answer could just as well be no. We're talking about, is there a connection between sin and suffering? Job was a good man who did not deserve to suffer as he was suffering. Job was described, you know, he, he ascribes suffering to Satan. Job chapter 2, verse 7 through 8. Job did not know that his pain and suffering had been brought to him by the activity of Satan. Nor did Job's friend realize that Satan was responsible for Job's suffering. Both Job and his friends believe that sin always produces suffering. Consequently, his friends concluded that because Job was suffering, he must be a great sinner. You know, I have said this before. When others are having COVID, it's because of sin. But when I have COVID, oh, it's the virus that is going around. Isn't that amazing? When somebody else is suffering, it's always sin. But when you suffer something, oh, it's just the environment, it's the weather changes, the pollen. Job knew in the deepest part of his being that he had not sinned in a manner that would provoke God to pour such a suffering on him. In the midst of his agony, Job gave voice to some very painful and pointed questions. And let me repeat those questions that Job had. How can a man be just before God? How can I stand before God? Why does God not come to me in the time of pain? Why will God not listen to my pleas? Why does God let things like this happen to me? If God is all powerful, why do these things happen? If he's love, why does he permit bad things to happen in our life? You know, traditions, the traditional answer during Job's day was that God does good for the good and bad for the bad. And many people today hold on to the same ancient ideas. The other side of the coin is that many of us expect favored treatment by God because of our virtues and our high self-esteem. Many become indignant with God because of suffering. 
and want to know why they have done, what they have done to deserve such pain. To the problem of why innocent suffer, the book of Job gives no complete and satisfactory answer. Job says, he's the God of the good and he's the God of the bad. All things work together for good to them that love God. Did you know the painful problem of undeserved suffering? You know what that is? It tells us from before the days of Job up to the present, men and women have grappled with the painful problem of suffering. We have come to recognize that while sin will produce suffering, not all suffering is due to sin. Pain and suffering assault us from all direction. Natural disaster produce suffering. Many suffer because of historical decision made by the different countries of the world. Ancestral choices bring pain on the descendants. You know, many, they believe in reincarnation all over the world. They say that pain is inevitable because of evil deed and conduct in the previous existence. They encourage this kind of benevolent behavior to improve one's lot in a future existence. Let me say something to you. You believe that there is life after death? You should. There is a life after death. And that is either you go to heaven or you go to hell. You know, you go to any restaurant, they give you two choices, smoking, non-smoking. I like to add in the bottom, eternity, your choice. You want a non-smoking session? Come to Jesus of Nazareth, confess him the Lord of your life. You want a smoking session? You deny him. Friends, there is no previous birth and you don't come back to this earth. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'll die and come back as a monkey one day. Seriously? Look at the population of the people. The number of people are growing, the number of animals going down. So something's missing in this. You don't come back as anything. After death, you stand before God. It's a judgment day. So... You think that because something you did in the last birth, that is why you are suffering today? No, 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 no. Whenever there is suffering, you need to ask a question. Is there a sin in my life? Is there direct disobedience to God in my life? I must always ask that question. Medical science can shed much light on this problem of pain. Only physician can say this. We differentiate between pain and serve a useful purpose and pain that serves no useful purpose. They can differentiate that. Examples of pain that severe, that serve as useful purpose are pain in the side indicates appendix. Pain in the back indicate some disc problem. Difficulty in chewing something, there must be an abscess in the tooth. So those pain are good. They give us warning. Some pain serves no useful purpose. Some have useful purpose. Some have no useful purpose. For instance, a muscle tension headache. You don't get anything out of that. It is a job for the, job for the doctor to differentiate between pain and serve as useful purpose of the pain, and that is useless. He separates that. Now, we have several choices when we face with the problem of pain. We can ignore it, we can investigate it, or we can do something about the pain. You know, Dr. Norman Geisler, he was a dear friend of mine who is now with the Lord. He said this, life, that he explained that much pain comes directly from our own free choices. It also comes to us indirectly from the exercise of our freedom. We also experience Pain because of free choices of others. We experience some pain because of the good choices that others have made. But in which accidents are involved? Geisler also said, attention to the fact that some suffering occurs because of activity of evil spirit. And friends, evil spirits are alive. They are active. 
And the only way that evil spirit can ever be controlled is when your life is filled with the Lord Jesus Christ. Some physical pains or evil may be God-given warnings to a greater physical harms. Not all pain is bad. When you touch the stove, you feel the pain, you move the hand, that's a good pain. Some physical suffering may be used by God to warn us against moral evils. C.S. Lewis, one of the great writers, said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. Let me repeat. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks, to, speaks in our conscience, but when, he, when there's pain, he shouts in our pain. God whispers in our pleasure and speaks to our conscience, but he shouts in pain. It is his megaphone to arouse a deaf world. Some pain and suffering may be permitted as a condition of producing spiritual refinement in the hearts of people. Romans 8, 28. We know all things work together for good to them that love God. Friends, Romans 8, 28 is not for everyone. It is for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and who call him as their Savior and Lord. Romans 8, 28 is actually only for born-again people. Just because you claim Romans 8, 28 and you don't have a personal relationship with Christ, Romans 8, 28 will not work for you. We have no satisfactory solution to the problem of pain and suffering. Our great hope and our steadfast faith must be in God. Not in pain, not in suffering, not in wealth, not in good health. But our faith should be in God. Who throughout all this is the record of his self-revelation in the scripture reveals himself as the God who is for life and health and relief and from pain. In heaven, he will wipe away every tears. There will be no death in heaven, no mourning in heaven, no crying in heaven, no pain in heaven. For the old order of things has passed away, according to Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. We should think of heaven not only as the destination but as the way of life. God is at work in the world to bring heaven into the person for those who trust and obey him. We can trust God to help us with the problem of pain and suffering. We can believe that he hurts when he hurt. We can believe that he weeps when we weep. We can look forward by faith to the day when pain will no more be there. There will not be any more tears. There will not be any sorrow. That place is called heaven. How can you experience that today? Come to Christ. Can you experience heaven on this earth? Yes. By accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. Friends, the world around us is becoming more wicked. Wars. Innocent lives being killed. Is God absent? No. He's still in charge. But you know what he wants you to do? Instead of talking about pain and suffering and the philosophy, he wants you to remove the philosophy and come with a simple faith to Christ and say, Lord Jesus, I want you to give me that assurance that one day you will take me to a place called heaven where there will be no tears. There'll be no separation from the loved ones. There will not be any sorrow. Does the world offer you any answer? No. God does. He gives you peace that is beyond imagination. He gives you joy that's unspeakable. Only Christ can do that. So if you're suffering today, you're wondering why the suffering, instead of focusing on why, look to the God who can solve it. And his name is Jesus. Will you say to the Lord, Lord, forgive me. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to realize that this pain and suffering is only temporary. I need to focus on eternity where there will be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain. Take me to heaven, Lord. If you pray that prayer sincerely from your heart, please write to us at P.O. Box 8808, Columbus, Georgia. Thank you again. God's really 
going to bless you if you trust him fully. Thank you for listening. God bless.